Good afternoon. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two main things. Uh, Mike originally asked me to talk about the CubeSat, but I figured it would be kind of sacrilegious not to talk about the high altitude ballooning that we do at Iowa State as well too. So I have a few slides about uh, the high altitude ballooning um, and also about what we're doing with our CubeSat as well too. Uh, before I get started though, both of these projects are under a program called M2I. Um, oh, actually, uh, just a little bit about myself. So as Mike said, yep, I'm faculty over in aerospace engineering. I run the Make to Innovate program, which I'll talk about. I'm also the assistant director for Iowa Space Grant Consortium. Um, do have my private pilot license, which is fun. And some of these pictures are actually taken from my plane. And I've been doing high altitude ballooning now for about 16 years. Uh, oh, and also I'm the president of the SBA, the Stratospheric Ballooning Association, um, if you've heard of it. So. Um, so, what is the Make to Innovate program that we have? So, we started this program in 2011. Uh, we started with about 90 students. We're now, uh, last spring we had about 200 students. We peaked at 300 students. Um, after I regained my sanity, I said we're not going to go much above 200 students. Um, so we're, we've been hovering around 200 students about the last year and a half now, so that's a good level for us to be at. Uh, we started the program as a way to give students hands-on experience. Uh, we kind of also consolidated a few other uh, projects that we had going on, including our high altitude uh, balloon uh, project. So we kind of want to give them all under one umbrella and give them some good support. It's now mature to a pretty, um, pretty large program that we have. Uh, we do, of course, the hands-on stuff, but as I'll talk about, there's a few other things that we focus on with that as well, too. Uh, the logo at the top is actually our brand new logo. Um, we'll probably start rolling that out in the fall semester. Um, the one on the bottom is the old logo that we had. So. so our philosophy is to reinforce students' understanding of engineering fundamentals. Um, we want to engage students with faculty. We want to engage students in industry um, and augment the skills that they learn. Uh, we do that by, uh, we have faculty advisors that work with the students, uh, and we also have a lot of industry support. So we have Boeing, uh, we have uh, Collins Aerospace, um, we've had Vermeer um, in the past, we've had uh, other people that have supported the program as well too, or they have brought projects for us to work on, um, and that's what we want to do. We want to get them engaged with those um, industry leaders uh, for that. Uh, so these are a few more pictures. So uh, we do a, a variety of different projects. Um, so you, you can see our Mars rover, uh, Raccoon, or no, it's not Raccoon. We did do a Raccoon project. This is a USLI. This is a NASA uh, student launch initiative. Um, this is a picture of our lab space that we have in Howe Hall. Uh, and of course, our high altitude ballooning. Um, so again, Rockets. Uh, we do some UAS work as well too. Um, so drones. Uh, a lot of those, uh, the students are actually building the drones. This is actually one that was built. Uh, this one actually, I think you guys had it up here. This one was actually designed and we were working with um, uh, power films for a solar powered uh, glider. Um, and of course the high altitude ballooning uh, and the CubeSat stuff that we do. So. Okay, so they have it, which I was a little bit taken aback because you guys were just playing the video from Ralph Wallio. Uh, that was probably one of the, I think, I'm guessing, probably one of the first Habit flights. Um, Habit originally started in 1995. Uh, Ralph Wallio was the person that kind of kicked things off, brought it to the Iowa Space Grant Consortium, and then Iowa State University kind of took it from there. Um, and so when I saw Habit on there and Ralph Wally, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense now. Um, so, um, so, good. Uh, I haven't talked to him for a number of years. Last time I, he had moved out of Iowa. I believe he is in Colorado now. He was going to be closer to his kids. Yeah. I haven't talked to him for a couple of years. You have? Or you haven't talked to him in a couple of years? Yeah. It, it, it was, it, yeah. It's probably been about four or five years since I talked to him. So, but yeah, we used to keep in touch quite a bit. Um, 
especially when I first came. So I first came on board in 2006 um, and uh, uh, kind of been doing the, the ballooning stuff ever since then. So um, More recently, we've been kind of revamping some stuff with the program. Uh, like with a lot of different projects, especially one that's been running in as long as this one, we've had ebbs and flows. Um, and we have a really good, great group of students uh, this last year. They went through and kind of revamped a lot of things. We kind of got back on track. Uh, we had five launches last year, so fall semester, spring semester, most of those being in the spring semester. Um, and uh, a pretty good success rate uh, with those. So we've also been working on some new hardware. And uh, uh, something that we're kind of excited about as well, too, is that we've got some collaboration with the University of Iowa um, that we're in, working on right now. Uh, so we revisited all of the procedures. Um, we love checklists. Uh, so we revamped a lot of our checklists. We were having a lot of times where mistakes were being made uh, during fill. Um, and so that's helped reduce a lot of those mistakes from being made. Um, we wanted to get back into a routine of doing launches on a more regular basis, which the students did an excellent job. Uh, and again, with the University of Iowa flights coming up, we wanted to make sure that we could support a multitude of different types of flights. Um, the pictures that you see here, these were all taken from um, the aircraft. I did not take these pictures, by the way. I was PIC. I had a student that was taking pictures while I was flying. Um, but this is our how hall is right here. Um, this is normally where we launch, which I just drove by um, a couple days ago. I've been in Europe for the last month, and they're now tearing that all out. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> it was a very nice little uh, apron to kind of um, launch from. Uh, so we'll have to see um, what, what the damage is with that and what they're all doing and, and see if we can still launch from there. But uh, we do launch right there on campus. Uh, we do coordinate with um, Des Moines uh, and Ames um, Airport, um, you know, anytime we do a launch for that. Um, if you're curious on how easy it is to see a payload on the ground when you're about 1,000 feet up, it's not. <laughs> Um, especially when this is uh, early spring and of course everything is just dull and brown and everything so it was kind of hard um, to see our box. Uh, we did eventually spot it but recovery had already gone to where it was uh, transmitting its position anyways. So, um, uh, Some hardware that we've been working on. We've been um, kind of going to a little bit more CubeSat-like hardware uh, we actually have some old CubeSat hardware that we've been integrating. Uh, we've been moving to uh, Raspberry Pi CM3 module for our uh, main processing unit. Um, and we've been moving to higher data um, speed transmissions. Um, so we've been using the Rocket M5s and we've been using the Feather LoRa boards for a lot of our uh, telemetry information. Um, we still use APRS. Um, it is mostly used as a backup um, for us. Uh, and it does come in handy. I mean, we've, we have had to use the backup, so we always insist on flying the backup for that. Um, if you've never flown the Feather LoRa boards, um, we have tested those now. We did a, a test flight uh, about two months ago. Um, had no problems um, up to 100,000 feet. Uh, the only problem that we had wasn't the radio issue. It was that after a post burst, um, the module came out of the socket. Um, so. But we fixed that in, in the later flight, so it worked out pretty well uh, as far as that goes. Uh, you can see this is, we still fly these. This is the Midland uh, with the open tracker uh, on it with a Garmin 18X uh, GPS puck on it. We also have some big red bees um, that we fly from time to time as well, too. So. Uh, so I mentioned that we've been doing some more collaboration work. Uh, so we got some funding through Iowa Space Grant Consortium. Uh, and we're working with the University of Iowa. This is kind of exciting because now we're going to get um, both universities kind of on board with some of this stuff. And it's a good springboard um, for some of our CubeSat stuff as well, too. Uh, so University of Iowa, if you don't know, University of Iowa um, does a really good job actually building payloads. Uh, they've actually built a number of um, existing hardware that has flown in space. 
uh, both CubeSats and non-CubeSats. Um, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to have their students learn some of those skills, but of course, as we'll talk about, it's expensive to launch things into space, so we came up with this idea of they can build it, we'll fly it on one of our high-altitude balloons, uh, and then everyone kind of win-wins uh, from that. My students get great experience uh, from that, and of course their students get good experience with that as well too. Um, again, we're also hoping that this moves into more collaboration down to CubeSat. We, Iowa State University is more of an engineering college, um, uh, science and technology. Uh, so for us, we love to build things, um, and so that's what we're, we're doing with all of this. Okay, so SciSat, whoops, is our CubeSat. So first of all, what is a CubeSat? Um, it's 10 by 10 by 10 cubic centimeters. Uh, that is the base, what they call a 1U CubeSat. Um, it's made to be launched uh, either from a rocket or uh, more recently, there's been some that have been launched now from ISS. That's where we will be eventually launched from. Uh, there is a pretty large network now of lots of universities and even high schools now that have launched CubeSats. Uh, and, you know, we have specifications that the students have to meet uh, from there. There's been CubeSats everywhere from pretty intense research projects to um, amateur radio payloads to a number of other things that have been done uh, with CubeSats. SciSat, uh, SciSat 1 specifically, is our CubeSat. It is a 3U CubeSat, so it will be 3 1U, so it will be 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters. Um, uh, it's been primarily done by undergraduates. There's been a, maybe a, one or two grad students helping, but it's been mostly an undergraduate effort. Uh, and that includes students uh, from aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical co engineering, computer engineering, um, almost any of the engineering majors and a few students from outside of the College of Engineering. Um, this has been a project in work since 2003. I came in on board in 2006 and it was um, not going very far. It took us a while, but then a, a few years ago, after about two attempts to get funding, we finally got funding, and a lot of things have been going very quickly now in the last couple of years. Um, we've also been working on both the structure and some of the payload in the bus system. Uh, and then, again, our satellite. We are doing a payload that's a scientific payload, but our main mission is, is education. Uh, so. Fabricate 3U CubeSat, we're going to be in a low Earth orbit for one to three months. We are using a software-defined radio radiometer um, to survey uh, soil moisture on Earth. Uh, this is actually based off of my research. Um, when I did my master's uh, in computer engineering, uh, I did one that we did a software-defined radio radiometer, and we proved that it does work, and we could get it to work. So they're basically taking my design and uh, implementing that into the CubeSat. Uh, this is a 3D rendering of uh, the CubeSat that we have. Uh, we're roughly weighing in at about two and a half kilograms. Uh, we can go up to about four if we really need to, so we have plenty of room um, for weight. Uh, you can see here, this is actually the radiometer antenna. Um, these antennas have changed. I'll show you a better picture of the antennas that we have for that. Um, and this is actually one of the cameras for the attitude determination control system. Uh, we are using amateur radio UHF frequencies for our communications. Um, the frame um, for this was all designed and built um, by the students. Uh, so that's why even though the University of Iowa has flown other CubeSats, we're the one that has done the whole thing. So we've built the CubeSat and we're, you know, we'll, be, we'll be flying it. So. Uh, this is another 3D rendering, so you can kind of see some of the components. So uh, the radiometer antenna that's right here. This, is, this big block is our attitude determined control system. Uh, this is our power system. Uh, and then in here we have some of the RF boards for the radiometer and our uh, computer board. And at the very top is our radio board. So uh, The solar arrays, this will be covered with solar panels. Uh, those are being all built uh, in-house. Uh, they use Spectral Labs, which is now owned by Boeing. 
um, for the uh, most of our solar cells. We also got some old solar cells donated from NASA uh, that were supposed to go to ISS. Um, so I guess they'll get there now uh, by way of, of CubeSat. Uh, so we have mixed cells on there that runs into our power board to regulate all of our charging. So how much does this all cost? <laughs> well, it's not cheap. <laughs> Uh, we, there, NASA doesn't tell us exactly how much this is a guesstimate, but it's probably at least 100000 just for the launch. So this is covered. We applied for and we were granted. Uh, NASA has what they call a CubeSat Student Launch Initiative. Uh, it's basically a grant from NASA that NASA basically says, you deliver us a, a CubeSat, we will launch it uh, for you, and we'll take care of all the costs associated with that. Um, they work with usually third-party vendors um, as well. Uh, for that, our third-party vendor is NanoRacks um, that is doing the integration for the ISS. Uh, the attitude determination control system was 40K. The radio was 5K. The EPS, that was $14,400. The EPS itself only cost $4,400. We had to spend $10,000 just to get the darn thing man-rated. Um, I am clearly in the wrong business. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so eh, that, that was, that was, we actually had to get a new EPS at the last minute because our old EPS uh, was not man rated and so it was actually cheaper and easier just to get all that taken care of. Uh, we bought a pumpkin kit a number of years ago which we do use for some development work. Um, the radiometer consists of an FP, uh, FPGA board and uh, some RF components. Uh, the FPGA board is about half this cost alone. Uh, the rest of it is in the RF front end. Uh, onboard computer was about another $5,000 cost, which unfortunately uh, we had to send in for repairs because the students decided to, uh, well, they didn't. They didn't do it on purpose, but uh, they ran five volts through a pin that's designed for only 1.8 volts. Um, and you can probably imagine how that went. Um, uh, and then the solar cells that we have. And again, some of these, uh, this doesn't include, of course, we have ones that were donated, but uh, these were the ones that we ended up purchasing from uh, Triselects and from Spectral Labs. Uh, payload, so I mentioned the software-defined radio. Uh, this is the FPGA board. Um, it, uh, Runs a uh, Xilinx FPGA, uh, also has an embedded processor so we can actually run a full-blown Linux operating system on there. And then we use um, low noise amplifiers to do our amplification before we sample that uh, and bandpass filters to make sure. Uh, this is set for 1.4 gigahertz. Um, that's where a lot of uh, radiometer work is done, especially for soil moisture. Um, there's other frequencies we could have used as well too, but um, 1.4 gigahertz is a fairly easy one to work with. So, um, and then the patch antenna that goes with that. Uh, communications. So this is from EnduroSat. This is a UHF. The um, module is right here. Um, and then the antenna module is right here. So this sits on the top of the CubeSat. Um, there's a low burners in there that then there's spring-loaded antennas that uh, pop out during deployment uh, from that. Attitude determination control system. Uh, this uses a combination of magnetorquers and reaction wheels. Um, it also has uh, two cameras on there and there are other uh, sun sensors or light sensors basically um, for determining its, its orientation. Um, there is no GPS or anything so most of it's just an orientation um, that it does but it does allow us to make sure that we're pointing at the earth which is kind of important when you want to do soil moisture. Uh, readings. So, uh, power system. Uh, this is another EnduroSat. Um, you can kind of see a theme with EnduroSat. Uh, this is an EPS. It has 20 watt hour capacity batteries. And then again, we run all of our solar panels into this and it regulates all the charging. Uh, this provides a 3.3 .3 and a 5 volt bus uh, for us to use. So, CPU. Uh, we started off with we were going to do our own in-house. Um, that ended up to be a little bit more than the students could take on, so we ended up purchasing 
this from EnduroSat. Uh, Cortex M4, 180 megahertz processor, has onboard data storage so we can store of our data in between when we're doing uh, data dumps. And uh, of course, through the I2C bus, we can talk to our ADCS system, our comm system, and our power system as well, too. Um, if, if you haven't noticed, one of the things that makes CubeSats kind of unique, uh, they all use this PC-104 connector that's on here. So everything stacks up uh, on that connector. So uh, This is our ground station at Hal Hall. So we use this for both CubeSat and for our high altitude ballooning. Uh, so that's why there's some other antennas on here as well too. So we have UHF, VHF capabilities. Um, this guy is our 5.8 gigahertz uh, dish for our Rocket M5s. Uh, and then we use, of course, uh, we have a FT817, we have a Kenwood TS2000. Um, all of these are in a penthouse, so we actually have to remote into a computer that talks to all these devices. Uh, I think maybe the last time I was here, or before that, um, we used to be on the second floor of Howe Hall, and we used to have a direct card line that went down into our lab. Uh, they then moved my lab into the basement, <laughs> and that made running coax pretty problematic. So the solution that we came up with was we um, set up a computer. We have everything that's computer controlled, and then we remote into that computer um, to talk to everything. So. Uh, so right now, uh, where we're at right now is we are finishing up some boards. I mentioned earlier we have one board that's currently being sent uh, for repairs. We were scheduled for a fall launch. Um, unfortunately, when the students damaged that board, that set us um, beyond our, our date that for delivery. Um, because the company in Durosat said the minimum is going to be probably a month and a half if not two months um, before we get that board back. And we were supposed to deliver in July. Um, so there just was not enough time to do that. Um, we're also finishing up a couple other um, boards as well too. Uh, once we have those, we'll finish the integration. We do need to go and do our vibration testing. Um, this is required. Uh, NanoRacks and NASA requires that we do a vibe test uh, on there. We may also do a thermal bake out um, as well too, although we do have some way of testing thermals in our labs. We don't have vibra bri ah, vibration testing though at Iowa State. Uh, then we'll, of course we'll do our final integration and we'll deliver to NanoRacks and NanoRacks will integrate with the rocket and of course that will go on to a resupply mission. So that will probably be, I believe that's NG13 uh, in fall of 2020 will be our next um, possibility. There is a possibility we could get on an earlier flight, but NASA does most of their CubeSats to this program in, on the uh, resupply missions um, in the fall. So, Question. Yeah. Does it go up to the ISS and then get ejected from the ISS? Out yes. The so it goes up to ISS. ISS, the astronauts that are on there take it. There is a specific P-Pod launcher that's actually then in, integrated into ISS. So I think last time they did this, it sat on ISS for like a month or so. And then, you know, whenever NASA says, that, okay, we can go ahead and launch these, they put them in there and they push them out. <laughs> That's pretty much all there is to it. And then it's on your own from there. So uh, we are required, I believe, it's at least a one minute that we cannot power on. So we have to wait a minute. And I think it's another... Uh, I think it's another five minutes then after that before we can deploy our antennas. So we do have, a, there is some stuff that has to do autonomously before it can even link up with us. So, uh, so let's see, time, brief timeline, yeah, so we, re, we got our launch opportunity in 2017. Um, we're going to be working on our finalizing integration and stuff now in the fall of 2019. Um, we'll plan for a handoff in 2020. Uh, we, can, we should be done really by the end of fall of 2019, but um, unless they tell us that we can get on an earlier flight, we won't plan on delivery until spring of 2020, and then it should be uh, NG-13. Yeah. Yes. In theory, yes. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so some of the challenges, in fact, that's a good thing. So the way that M2I works is that students sign up for a course, and they take that course. However, it is a repeatable course. So we oftentimes do have students that will stay on board for multiple semesters, so that helps. However, as any kind of academic institution, right, we have students that are hopefully graduating and moving on to bigger and better things. Um, documentation has been a very big challenge with a lot of that. Um, at Iowa State, we have what we call a Cybox, which is basically a box folder. Um, we also do use GitHub um, as well to kind of keep track of, especially a lot of our schematics and stuff like that. So yes, um, the nice thing is we also in M2I, it's fairly open. We have students from sophomore to seniors that are involved. So right, we try to mix that up as much as we can so that the upperclassmen can start mentoring some of the lower classmen. More than likely, they might move into even, even like a leadership position and help to kind of pass information on as well too. But we also have interruptions where sometimes we have students that come to us uh, uh, two weeks before the semester ends and said, oh, by the way, I'm going to go do in co-op next semester. <laughs> and we're like, have fun. And then we're like, OK, uh, you know. So yeah, we, we, we encourage the students to continuously document. And that works 60, 70% of the time. So uh, some other challenges we've had has definitely been with licensing uh, as well. Um, uh, we had to get both NOAA and uh, IARU and FCC uh, licensing. Um, IARU was kind of a pain. Uh, there's been a lot more, I don't want to say cracking down, but um, basically they're trying to make sure that the flights that are using amateur radio are, are falling within the guidelines of amateur radio. Uh, we fall under that guideline because it's education. Um, and, but we weren't very clear on that in our first application. So we actually had to submit twice and, and then I already said, oh, okay, you're doing this as part of a class, you're, you're fine. Um, NOAA wasn't too bad, it's just a lot of paperwork. And the reason for NOAA, by the way, is because we're remote sensing. Anything that has a camera, anything that is sensing something, um, NOAA wants to know about it and they need to give you a license for it, um, for that. Uh, lots of challenges with building parts of your own payload. Uh, sure, you save some money, but um, you know sometimes the students kind of bite off more than they can chew, and uh, so that's actually where we've kind of uh, the original plan. When when I first took took over this project in 2006, the students were like we want to build the entire satellite from scratch, and that's gone to now where probably 80% of it is now COTS, uh, commercial off the shelf. So. Uh, and then, even with COTS, there is sometimes in, uh, issues that you have with that. Uh, sure, if you go with one company like EnduroSat, usually a lot of that is taken care of for you because they've tried to make sure that it's compatible with their own stuff. Uh, but we ran into some compatibility issues with like the ADCS and a few other things. Um, and we just have to make sure that we move things around accordingly uh, for that. Uh, so yeah. Any other questions? I think I've taken up more than enough of your time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are most of the uh, universities using 3U size? Yeah, so when CubeSats first came out, 1U was kind of the norm. 3U has pretty much become the norm now um, because uh, the Peapod launchers can, will do a 3U without any issue. Uh, you're seeing more that are also, uh, especially a lot of the research-based projects are going more towards like the 6Us and the 12Us as well too, but yeah. Yeah? I get the idea of the educational value of this project, and it is awesome. But I'm kind of wondering about what you're adding to the scientific community. Would your soil moisture sensors be able to tell us anything more than what we're already getting from the Landsat? Yep. Good, great question. Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> uh, it won't give us anything then uh, what uh, like SMOS and some of the other ESA satellites that are up there that do remote sensing. Uh, the accuracy of this one um, is, is not anywhere compared to anything like that. Um, the, 
The one thing that it does help, though, is so one of the things with the software defined radio based radiometer is one of the things that both uh, uh, SMOS and uh, some of the other ESA satellites have found is that 1.4 gigahertz is supposed to be a protected frequency. No one's supposed to be transmitting on that. Apparently, some people in Spain didn't get the memo on that. <laughs> uh, they've been actually, and I think there was some interference that they've picked up coming from, I think it was uh, Africa or someplace like that. So even though it's supposed to be protected, there has been some interference found on those frequencies. One of the things that we have demonstrated, at least on the ground, is that we may be able to filter out some of that. And we can do that on the fly as well, too, because we're a software-defined radio. Uh, for that. So it's more of a technology demonstrator more than it is uh, as far as you know getting us tangible anything that's going to be more accurate or anything from any other existing soil moisture no um, we won't be doing that but it could be uh, you know leading the path for other stuff down the road so any other questions? If not, I'll, I'll probably be around at least for a little bit this afternoon. Unfortunately, I have another conference to go to tomorrow. Otherwise, I'd come back tomorrow. Um, and I've got some business cards, too, if anyone wants them. And we'll go from there. Thank you.